Good morning, Aboyt Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us this morning as we sing praise to our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you join us as we sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Perfect in love, you 
Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you are all doing well. I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 6, 10. But before we do, let's take a moment to speak to the author of this text. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege we have through technology to worship you, to hear your word, and then also to obey your word. And I pray that your spirit would have free reign in each of our hearts today, wherever we might be, whatever we might be facing. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would encourage us. We choose to worship you just now. And so we ask and pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What is an ambassador? Well, Wheaton's international law describes an ambassador as follows. Ambassadors are exclusively entitled to what is called, hear the word, representative character. Being considered as representing the sovereign or state by whom they are delegated and entitled to the same honors to which the constituent would be entitled were he personally present. How do you like all that legal talk? Basically what's being said is if you're an ambassador, you enjoy the same prestige, respect, dignity, and treatment as would the person who sent you. So if the president sent you, you would receive the treatment that the president would receive. So this is a lofty position. Uh, Chief Justice Fuller puts it like this, ambassadors possess in substance the same functions, rights, and privileges as agents of their respective governments for the transaction of its diplomatic business abroad. Their designations are chiefly significant in the relation of notice rank precedence, and dignity. So serving as an ambassador for the U.S., as an example, is a position of great, great dignity. However, there's a position of even more lofty dignity, and that is if you're serving as an ambassador for Christ, it actually is a calling of the highest possible dignity. It's a privilege, it's a responsibility, of course, but it's an honor to be able to represent the Lord as his ambassador. And so are we representing him well? And you say, well, preacher, why are you asking that question? Well, the reason why I'm asking that question of myself and of you is because in this text, it's very clear that Paul is saying in one sentence, we are ambassadors for Christ. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you thought you signed up it for not, maybe you didn't think this was your job description, it is, one of our responsibilities is we are to be ambassadors, representatives of Jesus Christ. And I want you to see it biblically. It is an honor and a privilege to represent him in any possible way. And so you're saying, well, I know that's in the Bible. In fact, you're going to see it straight. Paul's going to say we are ambassadors. It's very clear. But you may be wondering, okay, so what does an ambassador of Christ look like? What are the marks of Christ's ambassadors? It's a great question, and I thank you for asking it, because now I can proceed. So let's look at the first mark in the text. First mark of an ambassador of Christ is this. Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. We're picking up, if you recall, we left off in chapter 5. We're going to pick up there again, in this case, 520, where Paul writes... 2 Corinthians 5.20, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, Paul says, on behalf of Christ, be 
reconciled to God. Now, first thing we need to do, obviously, we do this every time. We see the word therefore. We have to ask, what is it therefore? And it links right back to verse 19. You see it there? Let's read verse 19. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us, I would add us as believers, the word of reconciliation. So the logic is, therefore, since he has committed to us the word of reconciliation, then therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. He gave us that word, that message for a reason that we might articulate it with urgency. And so we are his official representatives. That's a lofty responsibility, isn't it? We are his official representatives who are to faithfully communicate his message and reinforce it with our lifestyle. How we live, we'll talk more about this later, is going to back up or distract from the message we are articulating. And so beyond that, we are Christ's official spokespersons who are to faithfully communicate his message, i.e. the gospel, with our words. An ambassador back in the first century was a great title of honor, respect, and dignity. So in verse 20, he says, as though we were making, God were making an appeal through us. In other words, we're called to articulate God's message with God's authority, in God's power, and with a sense of urgency. You can feel it as you look closely at the, at the letter here. Look at verse 20. Look at uh, Paul's wording there. He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Remember verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so Paul's message to the world was very simply, get reconciled to God. But Paul is also addressing those unsaved Corinthians who have embraced the adulterated, tampered with gospel of those false apostles. Remember them? They came in with a truncated gospel in fact, Paul is concerned about the spiritual welfare of some of the believers in Corinth. If you keep your place, but go to chapter 13 and notice Paul's admonition here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, picking up at verse 5, he says there, 13.5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Now, why would he say that if these were all 100% on fire believers for Christ. Apparently he was concerned that some either lapsed or maybe never received Christ, and so he wants to make sure that they are in the fold. Now we go back to chapter 5 again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I just want to highlight that phrase again. Look at verse 20. He says, we beg you. You see, this message is of life and death significance. It's that important. Heaven and hell in the balance. And so right now, as you think about it, it's a sobering thought, but men and women, boys and girls, right now are on their way to a Christless eternity. And unless the Lord intervenes in some way, and often he chooses to use us to be his ambassadors, his messengers, that's their irrevocable destiny. And so their need is urgent. Do we, do you and I care enough? You see, the degree of our urgency reveals the degree of our compassion. So I can think of myself as a compassionate person, but if I really don't have a broken heart over the lost, I might want to re-examine that and think about it. As we see these dear ones who choose not to worship the Lord for whatever reason, as we see them through the eyes of Jesus Christ, our hearts should break as his does. He wants them to come to faith. And so Christ's ambassadors speak not just casually, but with urgency. Now look at verse 21. It's a wonderful verse. Actually, this verse could be a whole sermon by itself. 521. He made him, that is, God made Jesus. Well, what about Jesus? Who knew no sin, he never sinned, to be sin, this is incredible, on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Paul is laying out the ground of the message of reconciliation. This is the theological groundwork or foundation for the message that you and I are called to articulate as his ambassadors. And so he says, God made Jesus who knew no sin. I want to camp out there a while because when we get to the second part of that verse, 
it could be misunderstood that Jesus somehow was made a sinner, meaning he personally sinned. No, it's not the case. So I'm going to give you three witnesses from the Bible, and all three of these men were pagans. They were not believers, so it's not a biased opinion of any sort. You might want to write these verses down, all from Luke. Luke 23, 4. And Pilate, an unbeliever, said to the chief priests and to the multitudes, I find no guilt in this man. Jesus never sinned. Luke 23, 41. The thief on the cross said, we are receiving what we deserve for our sins, but this man has done nothing wrong. So one pagan says, no guilt in this man. Another says, he does nothing wrong. Luke 24, 47. Now when the centurion, another unbeliever, saw what happened, he began praising God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Three unbelievers, at least that's how they started, said, I find no guilt. He did nothing wrong. He is innocent. There's a strong testimony. So my point is, Jesus never, ever, and never will sin. He's not tainted by sin. Never. He's pure. He's immaculate. Now we go to the part where it says, God made Jesus to be sin on our behalf. It doesn't say he made him a sinner, but he made him to be sin. Now, Jesus was treated as a sinner, but that's because our sins were dumped on his shoulders, for lack of a better word. And the, the Father looked at him as though he were a sinner because he was nailed to the cross in our place as our substitute. It says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And so what you get in your paycheck, when, when you check your mail and you look in your paycheck for your sin, it doesn't have numbers behind it. It says D-E-A-T-H, death. That's our payment for our sin because we choose to separate ourselves from God when we sin. Now, since that's the case, if I were to say, hey, I love you and I'm going to die for you in, in your place to pay for your sins, even though maybe I mean well, there's no way that's going to happen. Here's why. First of all, I wasn't authorized to do that. God won't honor it. Secondly, I'm going to die because of my own sins. I have only one life and I, it has to pay for my sins. I don't have a life free to give away for your sins. Now, if I never sinned at all, then maybe my life would be free to give away for you. Enter Jesus. He never sinned. His life was free to give away on your behalf. Aren't you glad? Shouldn't you say praise the Lord? Isn't it awesome that he loves us that much? And so, theoretically then, and in fact, as I think about this, in reality, Jesus never sinned, and therefore, he didn't have to die, at least based on his own sin, Therefore, he's free to bear our sins and to die for us. And the question is, why did Jesus die for us? And that's a, a question that has a number of answers. I'm going to focus just on what's in this text. And that is, Paul says, so that, you see it there? So that Jesus died for you and for me, so that we might become, think about this, the righteousness of God in him. Wow. Wow. In other words, our sin was reckoned to Jesus because he's our substitute. A cr crazy thought, isn't it? The one who never sinned becomes sin and takes our sin away. But the other side is, not only do we get rid of our sin and have it dealt with, we receive his righteousness. It's reckoned to us. It's the great exchange. Lord, here's my sin. Oh, and thank you, I receive your righteousness. And so when the Father looks at us in Christ, on his glasses, there's crosses, and he sees us through the cross. We are his forgiven children as if we never sinned. When we know in practice we have sinned. So positionally, we are declared by God to be righteous, but then in our daily practice, we are trying, we are endeavoring to conform our lives to our lofty position in Christ. And this is the sanctification process. And so look at chapter 6, verse 1. It says, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, what is the context here? Go back to chapter 5, verse 10. You'll recall this verse. We looked at it previously, 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that's speaking of believers. If you know Christ, you will be before the judgment seat at some point. So will I. Now, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Think about that for a moment. We're going to lock eyes with Jesus at some point. 1 Corinthians 3.15, if you want it for your notes, 1 Corinthians 3.15, Paul says, 
If any man's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. And so, in other words, if you are at the judgment seat of Christ, don't worry about, well, is he going to judge me and send me to hell? No, the fact that you're in his presence means you made it. But then again, your lifestyle, the sanctification process we talk about, is just as important to the Lord. In other words, how you are living your life as a stewardship, however many years God grants us, only he knows that, but what we've done with our time, our talents, our treasures, will be called to account, and then either we will receive some rewards or no rewards. And so it's something to think about. It's sobering, but how will it go when I face, and I will, when I face Christ and lock eyes with him, how will it go as he reviews my life? I'm not trying to give any of us a guilt trip, but I'm just trying to explain what the Bible teaches, which is we will lock eyes. Now, for many of these Corinthian believers, they were living for themselves, and they were operating in the flesh. And Paul says, uh, make sure that you didn't receive the grace of God in vain. He's not saying there, make sure you lose your salvation. What he's saying there, and I think one scholar puts it well, he says, any time spent in the flesh is time in which we have accepted the grace of God in vain. That's lost time for a believer. We're squandering that grace, or we're not appreciating at least. If, and I believe when we sin, we're not in our right mind as Christians. We're forgetting who we belong to. We forget who we are in Christ. And Satan has us on a wobble for a while. And we need to come back to our senses. We would not sin if Jesus was physically in the room right now, would we? But we do this as though he's not seeing it or doesn't know about it. Now, if you go back to chapter 5, verse 15, he says there, And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. That's the point. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And so we should no longer live for ourselves. And this is why Paul says, back to 6 1, the urgency, pick it up there. Notice he says, We also urge you. You see the urgency there. Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency, and that's what Paul is doing. He is urgent right now. Now, if you look at 6.2, I want you to know that's really a parenthetical verse. Nevertheless, it's a very urgent message there. He's quoting Isaiah. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Again, this is urgent. Now, he says. Isaiah 49, 8 is what's being quoted here, and you'll see the phrase there, time and day. Now, those refer more to an age. It's not like 7 o'clock on July 3rd. That's not it. It's more during this era, during this age is the idea. And he says now twice. He's repeating it for emphasis. The urgency of this present age of grace the church age is what's being addressed here. So Paul's saying to the believer in the church age, look, you've already received the grace of God. See to it that you do not forfeit your reward. Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. You say, okay, you told me I'm an ambassador. You told me I have a message. What is my message? Well, our urgent message to the unsaved is you need to be reconciled to God. And yet our urgent message to those who know Christ already, to the saved, is look, live for Christ, not for yourself. He gave his life for you. Live a life that is set apart for him. Can you see that Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency? Many of you will remember the name Corey Ten Boom, a godly woman. Uh, you know her story during World War II. Well, here's a quote from her. She says, If I straighten the pictures on the walls of your home, I'm committing no sin, am I? She's actually doing us a favor if the pictures are crooked, right? But suppose that your house were a fire, and I still went calmly about straightening the pictures. What would you say? Would you think me merely stupid or very wicked? Here the house is burning, and she's not saving anybody. She's just fixing the pictures, right? The world today is on fire. What are you doing to extinguish the fire? It's a great question. You know, we can be very casual. We're so blessed here in America, thank God. But we can be so casual, worried about our luxuries and all the things that we pursue. There's no sin inherently in any of those things, except we can forget about people all around us who are dropping and facing a Christless eternity. And so do you, do I have a sense of urgency 
toward the lost. Who have I, who have you been praying for? Who need, we all know people who need Christ, right? Probably the majority of people we know in a larger circle need Christ. And so it's time to act. And you say, yeah, but preacher, I'm with you, and I feel it, and I want to do it, but we're in a time of pandemic. My hands are tied. Well, yes and no. We are limited, that's for sure. But, you know, if you have the technology, you can certainly do a video conference or video call with Zoom or you name it. You say, yeah, but I don't have that technology. Well, you can do a phone call. I mean, there's FaceTime. Well, I don't know how to do that. Okay, you can make a regular phone call or you can send a text. I have a dear friend. I've known him for maybe 35 years. He's a pastor. We went to school together. He sends me encouraging verses almost daily. He's a great brother. We've had a great conversation the other day encouraging each other. We've known each other a long time and have been through all kinds of things. So there's an example right there. You can even send an email. Some people actually still read email, believe it or not. Or good old-fashioned, now dare I say it, snail mail. You say, yeah, but that one takes, well, here's the point. Imagine somebody getting a good old-fashioned letter in their mailbox saying, wow, this person must have took a lot of time to think this through and write it out. They must really be thinking about me. They must really care about me. That might be a way to really blow their mind, send them a snail mail letter a heartfelt, thoughtful letter. It might be a blessing. You don't know how lonely people are today. We're all locked in in a lot of cases, right? And don't have much social interaction like we used to. I'm hearing there's a resurgence of interest in the end times, prophecy. People are wondering, is this the end of the world? Is Christ coming back? What's going on? Take advantage of that. Maybe you have a, a, a preacher or teacher or two, or a theologian who are sound, and they have a video on YouTube. You can just send that link to a friend of yours if they're wondering or talk to them if you can do that. But there's ways, I'm just giving you some of many examples, to reach out and still evangelize and let people know that Jesus loves them and he wants to save them and they need him more than they realize. We can still do that by the grace of God. Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. I hope you're getting the point. We are, it's our job description, we are ambassadors for Christ. Well, what does an ambassador of Christ look like? What are the marks of an ambassador for Jesus Christ? We've seen one already. The first mark is Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. But there's another mark, and here it is. Christ's ambassadors act with integrity. This reinforces the message, right? Christ's ambassadors act with integrity. Now look with me, please, at chapter 6 and verse 3. Paul says, "...giving no cause for offense in anything..." so that the ministry will not be discredited. Now, integrity was a priority in Paul's life. There's no way around that. It was very important to him. He lived it out. If you go back to chapter 1, keep your place. Chapter 1 and verse 12 says, For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, Paul's describing himself here, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. You can go back to chapter 6. Paul is saying, look, you've seen me. In fact, he spent a year and a half in Corinth. You've watched me close up. You've seen my life. I have integrity. Of course, it's the grace of God. I, I'm not taking any credit here. But by God's grace, I live the life of integrity. Now, here's the question. As we think about integrity... Why should we act with integrity? Because the law says so, because people expect it, so we won't have a guilt complex. Why should we do it? Well, he answers it right there. One reason is, in order, verse 3, 6, 3, in order that the ministry be not discredited. In other words, Christ's reputation is at stake. The gospel itself, the integrity of the message is at stake. And so Christ's ambassadors act with integrity in a way that will not dishonor the one who sent them. If it was the president sending us, we would want to act honorably so he doesn't look bad. In this case, we want to represent Christ well for his reputation and the gospel's sake. That's why Paul says in 6.3, giving no cause <clears throat> for offense, in other words, unbelievers, uh, and you know this, they're watching us at all times, and they are incredibly sensitive to hypocrisy and inconsistency. They'll point it out just like that. Now, they're not living that way, but they would say, hey, I'm not a Christian. These are not my rules. I do what I want to do. But you guys say you are perfect like Jesus, which we don't say, but that's what they think. 
And you guys are hypocrites. You say A and you do B. You say B and you do A. I don't need your Jesus. They use that as an excuse to not come to him. We want to eliminate that obstacle, right? And again, we're not perfect, but this is intentionally relying on the Spirit of God and the grace of God working through us. And so, he says, giving no cause for offense. Then in verse 4, but in everything, think about this, <clears throat> in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God. Now, in verse 3, he said, in anything. And now in verse 4, but in everything. And so, what's going on here? Well, this requires diligently cooperating with the Spirit of God. In other words, this will not happen, my friends, unless there is an intentional, willful, I would say, enthusiastic surrender to the Spirit of God. Surrender for God's empowerment. This is the essence of the Christian life. It's the third person of the Trinity living the Christian life through us as opposed to us doing stuff for him in our own strength. That's a setup for failure. That won't happen. And so he says, commending ourselves as servants of God. Now go to chapter 5, verse 12, because he addresses it there also, 512. He says, we are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. He's saying, we are not commending ourselves to you verbally. He's saying, look, my attitude and my actions are really all the commendation I need. I've acted with full integrity. Now, can you and I say the same thing? Are we known by those who know us best as people of integrity? Is there something in our lives which compromises our testimony? That needs to go. We need to give that to the Lord, and he'll take it. Gladly, he'll take it. And so the question might enter your mind, well, hey, preacher, how does one acquire integrity? It's a great question. Well, integrity comes, first of all, from an authentic prayer life, being transparent in the presence of God, not hiding anything from him. He knows it all before we even get on our knees to pray. So to hide would be a dumb thing to do, really. He already knows it. So living a daily life where we are in his presence, being authentic with him, and then gladly submitting to the word of God. So basically what I'm saying is we're speaking to him. That's half of a relationship. And then he speaks back to us in, in the word of God. Prayer, fancy word for speaking to him. The word of God, fancy word for him speaking to us. If we've got both of those going, we've got an ongoing dynamic relationship with him, a love relationship, if you will, we're going to be okay. But things lure us away, right? Activities, hobbies, you know, it could even be good stuff, a you know, job, whatever, and we get distracted, and that's where the problem comes in. But see, Christ's ambassadors act with integrity because they want to reinforce the message, and they do it out of love for Jesus, empowered by him in the first place to even accomplish such a lifestyle. So I hope you see the point here, dear friends. We are honored in that we are ambassadors for Christ. I'm not up for the task, are you? Well, that's a, that's a side issue, really, because he equips us for the task. It's not a question of my ability as much as it is a question of my availability. Are you available? Am I available to be his spokespeople who back up the message with our lives? And so we're exploring this question. Well, what does an ambassador for Christ look like? What are the marks of an ambassador of Jesus Christ? I want to be a good one. I need to know what it looks like. Well, we've said that one mark is Christ's ambassadors speak with urgency. Another mark is Christ's ambassadors act with integrity, and that backs up the message. And here's a third mark, and that is Christ's ambassadors persevere with joy. You say, those two words, do they really go together? Yeah, Paul lived it out. Christ's ambassadors persevere with with joy. We're in a tough context right now. We're being called on to persevere, right? But I'm talking about something that goes beyond a grin and bear it mentality. Look at verse 4, the latter part, 6-4. In much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses. Now, that phrase, in much endurance, that is an emphasis in the Greek there. He's emphasizing the word endurance. Again, it's not a grin and bear it mentality, but it's a victorious joyful perseverance. You say, but I don't feel joyful. Well, you're just being honest. Join my club. I feel the same way. However, the joy comes from the one living in you because the fruit of the joy, fruit of the Spirit is joy. You know, all the love, joy, peace, we'll talk about those in a moment. But that's where the joy comes from. Don't think you have to work it up somehow. It comes from Him. 
And so those who faithfully live for Christ will experience some affliction. Sorry about that, but it's true. Some hardship, some distress. And so I'm wondering, why is suffering, relatively speaking, so foreign to the modern Christian's experience here in the U.S.? Is it because we live in the U.S. as opposed to Saudi, for example? Well, that's part of it. Definitely that's part of it. Or is it because we are not openly and actively, publicly living for Christ? You see, if you don't want the sparks to fly, just hide in the closet and don't let anybody know that you belong to him, and there'll be less heat. But once we get out in the public square and actually start living a Christ-like life in an anti-Christ culture, oh, the sparks will fly, the heat will go up. But actually, if you can train yourself to see that as a badge of honor, that maybe I'm doing something right if people don't like my Christ-like behavior, assuming it's not me in the flesh being a jerk of some kind, but rather they're seeing the attributes of Christ being manifested in my life, and they don't like it because they don't like my Jesus, well, then maybe I'm doing something right. When I'm not doing anything, the only one who smiles is Satan. Good, I've relegated him to the sidelines. He's of no effect. That's, I got him where I want him. We don't want that. We want to stir it up for the Lord, if you know what I mean. Look at verse 5. Imagine what Paul went through in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger. Think about it, beatings. In 1123, he says, I was beaten times without number. Wow. Verse 5, imprisonments, Acts 16.23, if you want it for your notes, Acts 16.23. And when they had inflicted many blows upon Paul and Silas, they threw them into prison. Then he says, verse 5, tumults. What does that word mean? I don't use that every day, do you? That means uproars or riots. Acts 17 and verse 5. But the Jews formed a mob and set the city, here's the word, in an uproar. Same word. They were seeking to bring Paul and Silas out to the people. And then he says, labors, verse 5 again. In 1123, he asks, are they, the false apostles, are they servants of Christ? These false apostles claim to be super apostles, super servants of the Lord. He says, I speak as if insane. I more so in far more labors. Paul is showing us his resume here. And instead of I got a PhD and I did this, and he's saying, yeah, I've been beaten. I've been thrown in jail. That might be a sign that he loves Jesus, right? Because a lot of people won't go through what he went through. Sleeplessness, Acts 20, 11. Paul talked with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. He didn't sleep that night. He taught the word of God all through the night. Hunger, which we take for granted here. In other words, it's rare that we're really truly hunger. Our stomach may growl, but we can go get a granola bar or something, right? This is hunger without food available. 1127, I have been in hunger and thirst often without food. Now, what's interesting, and this list can go on and on, but this was the midway point of Paul's ministry. So what does that mean? That means there was much more suffering to come. Wow, perseverance. How could this guy be joyful in the midst of all of that? Look at verse 6. In purity, look at these good qualities here, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth. Now, this is how Paul endured, right? In the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Look at verse 6. In the Holy Spirit, Paul was yielded to the giver of these graces. Well, what are these graces? One is the spiritual gifts. The other is the fruit of the Spirit, in particular, joy, patience, self-control. In the context of endurance, you're going to need joy to keep your spirit buoyant. You're going to need patience to hang in there. You're going to need self-control that you don't lash out or freak out or punch out, and you hang in there. Christ's ambassadors persevere, but they just don't grin and bear it. They persevere with joy, and don't miss it. Verse 7, in the power of God. Divine enablement allowed Paul to persevere with joy. Are we yielded to him? Now, notice verse 8. He says, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers, and yet true as unknown, yet well known as dying. Yet behold, we live as punished, yet not put to death as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing 
all things. Wow. Paul persevered through a lot of misunderstanding. Look at verse 8. It says, glory and dishonor. Some treated Paul with esteem. Some treated him with contempt. Evil report and good report. When absent, Paul was both slandered and spoken well of, depending who the person was. Regarded as deceivers, Paul was misunderstood. Regarding his canceled visit, remember we talked about this? Let's go there real quick. Chapter 1, you'll recall this. Uh, Paul was going, to, at least he intended to visit Corinth, but for good reason he changed his plans, which all human beings have a right to do. Well, the false apostles pounced on that and said, look at Paul, he's fickle. 115, chapter 1, verse 15. In this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing, that is, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Like the false apostles are accusing me. Or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, like the false apostles are accusing me, so that with me there will be yes, yes and no, no at the same time, you know, like double tongue kind of a thing? You can go back to chapter 6. So what Paul is saying there is, look, I'm being regarded as a deceiver. The false apostles think I lack integrity. You guys know me. I've been with you all these years. You know better. I live a life of integrity. Verse 9, regarded as unknown. In other words, regarded as a non-entity. That's how they viewed Paul. He's a zero. 1 Corinthians 4.13, he says, we have become as the scum of the world. You see, the world misunderstood Paul. He's living under a great misunderstanding and basically slander. He says, yeah, they, I'm regarded as nothing, as unknown, and yet, verse 9, we are well known. By whom? By God. He knows them, Paul and his associates, very well. He knows you inside out as well. And so it says in 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knows those who are his. John 10.14, I am the good shepherd, hear this one, and I know my sheep. That means he knows you and he knows me. Verse 10, as sorrowful. In other words, Paul did experience times of sadness. Remember the painful visit where he went to Corinth to confront some of the enemies and they rebuked him to his face and the Corinthians, where were they? They didn't back him at all. They turned their back on him and he left humiliated. He says, yet I am always rejoicing. The joy of Paul's salvation was able to withstand any suffering. Now that comes from God. We can't conjure that up. Ours is based on circumstances. But the joy he gives transcends circumstances. Because Paul knew that his suffering brought glory to his blessed Redeemer, he could face anything with joy. You see, Christ's ambassadors persevere with joy. Now, during this pandemic, probably all of us know somebody who is discouraged, down and out for whatever the reason might be. They lost their job or whatever. Brother, sister, God has given us resources that maybe they don't have. Let's use those resources as a stewardship to bring honor to him and to bring encouragement to this dear one who is suffering, whatever the case might be. This is what we're called to do, and there's a backsplash that comes back our way. Let's spread the joy of Jesus. It's going to splash right back on us. This is the way God does things. Christ's ambassadors persevere with joy. Now, you probably heard the story about an old man who was walking along a beautiful beach by the sea. This was at dawn. The sun was just starting to come up. And he noticed a young man ahead of him walking along the beach, picking up starfish and throwing them into the sea. And this uh, basically piqued his curiosity. And so he caught up with the youth and he asked, hey, what are you doing? And, and the young man said, well, look, I'm looking at these stranded starfish here and they're going to die. If the, if the morning sun gets intense, they're going to die. And the old man thought about it and he said, but wait a minute, look, this beach goes on for miles and miles and miles. And there are millions of starfish probably here. How can your effort make a difference? Well, the young man looked at the starfish in his hand, and then he threw it into the safety of the waters, and he pointed to that starfish, and he said, it makes a difference to that one. He may not get all the millions, but he at least saved one in that instance. Dear starfish, Aren't you glad that when you were stranded in sin, somebody actually cared enough to introduce you to the infinite sea of Christ's forgiveness, undeserving as we are? Aren't you glad somebody intervened, saw that we were perishing, 
and actually made a difference? You see, we're not called to evangelize millions of people. Some have a special call. I think of Billy Graham, and he was called to go over, and some have that, but most of us are not called to evangelize millions, but at least to evangelize some. You know, John says in 112, but as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, you can do that right now. Call on his name. He will save you and forgive you of your sins. If you have received his forgiveness, aren't you glad? And doesn't it make you want to persevere with joy and be an urgent ambassador who backs it up with integrity, living out this calling that we have to be ambassadors of Christ for his glory because he's worth it? Dear friends, we are ambassadors for Christ And of all the people on the planet, we are the ones who are most blessed. Let's give him thanks, shall we? Father, we want to thank you that you, in your mercy, have first of all extended salvation to the likes of us. We have relatives and friends who, for whatever reason, are not saved right now, and yet we are. That's because of your mercy and your grace. Icing on the cake, Lord, you actually give us the privilege of being your ambassadors your representatives who are living it out, who are speaking it. And Father, we want to be found faithful. We want to do this as an act of love and worship to you. We pray that in the days ahead, you'll give us great creativity during these tough times to know how we can reach out and be a blessing to others. So use us in the days ahead, and may you receive much glory and pleasure as a result. We pray this in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Go in and be an ambassador.